Welcome to Today at Wayne, a podcast that engages and informs the Wayne State University campus community. With news, announcements, information, and current events discussions relevant to the university's goals and mission, Today at Wayne serves as the perfect forum for our campus to begin a conversation or keep one going. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Today at Wayne podcast. I'm your host, Daryl Dawsey. Long before the rains that inundated the metro Detroit area for much, much of this summer, the region has been pounded by massive deluges before. In 1986, southeastern Michigan experienced its worst flooding in half a century as rainfall averaged between six inches and one foot for three incredible days in September. Damage was estimated at as much as $500 million. This was topped in August 2014, when nearly five inches fell in one day alone in rainfalls that would eventually leave Metro Detroit with flood damage estimated at $1.8 billion. This year's flooding, however, may well go down as the worst ever, for now. For instance, more than six inches of rain fell in 24 hours in June of this year. During one 32-day stretch, rain fell for 22 days, dumping more than five and a half inches on the region at a time when the area usually averages about three inches. Highways have been overwhelmed. Scores of cars have been left stalled and waterlogged. Hundreds of homes, if not more, have been severely damaged. And the fallout has extended far beyond freeways, curbsides, and residential basements. Fears of climate change have been amplified. Lawsuits have been filed. Public confidence has been eroded like so much sandstone. Meanwhile, government officials like those at the Great Lakes Water Authority, which wrested control of the city's water system from Detroit government when the city was forced into bankruptcy in 2013, are pointing fingers and shifting blame. To help us make sense of all this, the Today at Wayne podcast is joined today by William Schuster, professor and chair of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Wayne State University. Bill has become an increasingly vocal and important voice in the rising debate over why Detroit floods, what's to blame, and what should be done about the problem. And now he's here to talk with us about our regional response to what appears to be a rapidly worsening issue and how we might get out of this mess. Bill, welcome to the Today at Wayne podcast. All the best, Daryl. Thanks for having me. So let's get at it. Um, First of all, just how bad has the flooding been this year as compared to previous years and as we look at our averages? Well, the, the flooding, something has shifted. Uh, what we're talking about is extreme but unpredictable rainfall events. And, you know, this gets away from, you know, 500 year storms, 1000 year storms. Like when we get into, you know, the probabilities and stuff like that, um, we're in, we're in some new, new territory here. And so let's take uh, June 25th, 26th. Okay. for example and we had a soaking rainfall event that was followed uh, by an unprecedented pulse of rainfall that fell hard you know this is the rainfall intensity mm-hmm. was very high for a short period of time and so that pre-soaking event it's kind of like as if we had paved our whole city <laughs> like the rainfall hit the ground and if it was if it was soil that soil was saturated and so we had runoff you know everywhere everything acted like a paved surface when you rain on it and so so we get we get that's where we get the flooding okay. you know for example you know my street in gross point park went up 22 inches Wow. above the curb, you know, like where the curb meets the street, 22 inches. Um, that was the peak flood stage. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, cars, anything parked in the street, like my car, totaled. Mm-hmm. Um, but then we had the matter of, of wastewater, you know, the backups. And so basically there were, there were failures within the wastewater conveyance system mm-hmm. and the pumping systems that affected, you know, all the east side, you know, the west side, Inkster, Dearborn, uh, Downriver, Melvindale, Garden City. Mm-hmm. And so when and you so, say failure, do you mean these things just weren't working or were they just not turned on the way they should have been? Well, that's, and there's, there's a little bit of both there. Okay. Talking uh, the east side, west side of Detroit, 
again, Inkster Dearborn, um, you know, the East Side writ large, uh, Detroit, the Gross Points, Harper Woods, um, East Point, uh, then down river. Those are all what I call heavy wastewater traffic zones because we got a lot of flow coming in from, from Macomb County and Oakland County and from Western Wayne County. And all that meets, you know, there's, there's this, you know, this traffic jam, so to speak, for wastewater. And even if everything was, was working, you know, like the pumps were working, you know, everything was right on and starting up on command, you know, this goes for our, our MDOT operated uh, pumps there on uh, our, our freeways. Even if everything was working, it would have been a lot, lot to ask of the system because it was designed for a different time and place. Um, you know, and, and water always wins. Uh, we just need to give it, you know, when we manage water, we have to give it a place to go because otherwise it makes its own decisions mm -hmm. and, and not usually in our interest, um, us human critters. So, um, but getting back to the, the other, you know, the, the wastewater issue is that the pumps were not working. Uh, we didn't have full, uh, we didn't have the benefit of regional full pumping capacity, you know, online at the time. So, you know, Jefferson Chalmers, uh, Cornerstone Village, Gross Point Park, you know, basically, we, we, there is no room for septic flows in these areas. And if you're Jefferson Chalmers, you're, you got Detroit River mm -hmm. on the east, you got the Jefferson waste, uh, Wastewater Interceptor on the west, and then you've got Connors Creek and Fox Creek, you know, kind of blocking you in. Right. And most of most of uh, Jefferson Chalmers was below the surface of, you know, it's, it's diked up all around, you know, to try to, <laughs> this is to say that, you know, calling out Jefferson Chalmers, this is a very unique area. And, and, I, and I start to get in now to the, the importance of, we really need data equity. Okay. We really need to understand the unique nature of how each of our communities live with water and are affected by water. And when I say water, it's it's the Detroit River, it's groundwater, it's wastewater, it's drinking water. Um, it's the way that each of our communities respond to rainfall events. And you know, the fact that most of our, our systems are are undersized, they're a, they're a piece of our history. <laughs> that haven't transitioned quite quite as well to the new this new age mm -hmm. um, and so by data, data equity we really i think owe ourselves as a culture as a society to to understand how water moves through our, our communities mm -hmm. and now when you say data equity does that mean that the information from any of these communities simply is not there I would argue that it's not. Okay. I would, at best, it's incomplete. Um, but hey, can we can we get a groundwater study mm -hmm. in Jefferson Chalmers to say, well, maybe we need to be managing Jefferson Chalmers more like New Orleans? Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is just again getting a benchmark, you know, data around that, which is not rocket science. This is you know, this is routine stuff that we know how to do. Okay. Um, doing flood studies in in our different, you know, uh, Detroit River, Down River, um, you know, Inkster, Dearborn communities say, hey, you know, this is where the hot, these are where the flash points are. Okay. These are the, these are the points that really need you know, some, some different kinds of infrastructure, you know, put in, but you have that basic data. And this is basic engineering practice is, you know, having the proper benchmark data to work from to create a design that actually serves 
Now, um, you, you suggested this isn't necessarily hard stuff to do or hard information to aggregate. Why hasn't it happened, Bill? Well, this is just, I think, you know, a societal response to to a creeping issue that's um, that's been well again creeping up on us. Uh, we we have these these warnings, these indications over time uh, with these disasters. Um, what gives me hope that maybe this is different, and and this is it's so important to say that hey, you know. This has been a disaster for all of us. This is an equal opportunity destroyer of health, right. property, and morale. Right. And the fact that it's happened, you know, basically three times this this summer, um, if not four times, you know, or if, or more, depending mm -hmm. on where you live and where you're at in in the wastewater system. Um, but this addresses some very human aspects, you know, the feeling of vulnerability, there's fear. You can feel it on the east side when it starts to rain. You can see it in, in how people are responding, you know, that there's self-violence, there's interpersonal violence, there's, there's that, you know, kind of anxiety that doesn't have anywhere to go. And so by giving them water so, somewhere to go and having, you know, like a, you know, a, re, a regional response, as well as a local response to give people faith that, hey, you know, we're starting to work on, on this infrastructure issue and protect, you know, and, and deliver a level of service that we should all take comfort in and enjoy. Um, but I, I just think that, uh, again, the fact that it's an equal opportunity um, destroyer of health, and that's physical health and mental health, uh, emotional health, um, property, and morale, mm -hmm. uh, this, does this translate to, to political will and okay. social will? to direct, for example, infrastructure dollars. We can get hit over the head with large price tags, mm -hmm. but what are we losing right. uh, in, the, in the absence of, of progress towards this? How bad is it? Let me just get an assessment from you, from an infrastructure standpoint. Just how bad, how old is the infrastructure? I mean, obviously this is you know, an infrastructural issue, what can you give me some sense of the magnitude of the problem that we're facing infrastructure wise? I always call out uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers uh, studies. Basically, they produce a report card each year, and I can forward to you the uh, the website. It's very informational, but for every aspect of of American infrastructure, transportation, you know, energy distribute, you know, production distribution, wastewater, stormwater. Um, you know, drinking water. They give you a, they give a grade for each of these, and they have certain criteria. And we're consistently, as a, as a nation, you know, in a, in a failing mode. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. maybe a, a C minus at best. Okay. Uh, but locally, excuse me. You know, a lot of resources go into assessing the, you know basically doing condition assessments of our infrastructure and making sure that all of our assets are mapped and we understand, is this pump, you know, does it exist? Is it still working? You know, it, does it need replacement mm -hmm. on, on a certain schedule? You know, where are we at? And, and so, so our infrastructure is in pretty bad shape. Um, it's been sitting, you know, it's, it's all below ground. Mm -hmm. We don't see it. This is a service we get 24-7, 365. But, you know, out of sight, out of mind is, is what I think we're, we're going to be challenged by. You know, this is very meaningful infrastructure and affects our lives. Um, if, you know, if we're not getting wastewater services, and then on top of that, we lose our power, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, 
the DTE contractors from Kansas and New York who came through my neighborhood, uh, you know, last Saturday. And after four, you know, three and a half days of uh, power being out and several rainfall events, I should add, um, we, they said, this is probably the worst distribution infrastructure that we've seen <laughs> in their travels, um, wow. you know, and I was like, so how does that, how does this work? You know, and I got, I got a call out to the, you know, folks across the east side, across Dearborn, Inkster, uh, downriver, we all have different abilities to cope, you know, and a lot of this comes, uh, comes through, you know, different levels of privilege. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these, these need to be addressed as well. Mm -hmm. um, this is a huge, huge issue. I think I would encourage your listeners to um, read a, a book by uh, Alicia Montgomery. It's uh, the name of the book is Greening the Black Urban Regime. Greening the Black Urban Regime. Right. And that's 2020 on the Wayne State University Press. Okay. Uh, I found this book to be instructive and learning a lot. There's a lot of good civil environmental engineering in this book. Mm -hmm. That's the way that I have interpreted it. And, you know, drawing connections between how our infrastructure has been, in effect, racialized over time, or the outcomes, you know, express uh, or represent a certain level of, of racialization. So when you talk about the distribution of infrastructure and the, or the maldistribution of infrastructure, we're talking about a maldistribution based along class lines, racial lines in many instances. That would be arguable. And the fact that, that by becoming a you know, heavy wastewater traffic area mm -hmm. that runs through for, through the communities who are least able to to be resilient to this to be in our continue to be most vulnerable okay. so you know when i drive to work i drive through you know i'm passed routinely on mac avenue at 70 miles an hour you know there's people walking into traffic you know, this is what I see an outcome of feeling vulnerable and the fear and the anxiety and, you know, things in, in many areas, uh, at least on the east side, uh, have not appreciably improved since the 1967 uprising. And so how do we, how are we going to, you know, there's definitely a, a social and cultural component here, you know, as Detroiters, we're, we're proud of aspects of our culture that are are deeply embedded in, in the communities that we live in. Mm -hmm. And I'm only two years into this. I grew up in the suburbs of Detroit okay. in the seventies. And, um, but Jefferson Chalmers, again, very unique relationship with water. You know, this is kind of bringing it around. Um, there's going to be these, these social and cultural drivers for data equity, knowing what we're into, you know, working with this infrastructure that's been either left behind or left unmaintained um, for for many years, and their their coincident, you know, their co-location with vulnerable communities, and then. How does that drive forward, you know, directing the substantive opportunity for federal, state, county, local, and philanthropic cooperation and collaboration to make this work? Let me uh, ask you, if you were in charge, where would you start? What's, what, what, are, what are the most urgent areas where we need this infrastructure shored up? Well, I, I would say that again, it's these hot spots, you okay. know, that lit up during the most recent flooding. Uh, clearly, you know, there, there, are, there's too much flow coming in through these areas, okay. and they're being asked to be the bottleneck 
and if if the water doesn't have anywhere to go and ratepayer basements and commercial properties are being used as temporary storage <laughs> for that overflow um, that's where we need to make make the difference okay. and you know so is it the pumping stations is it you know, do we need more sewer line more sewer line like from an in, just for the lay person from an infrastructural standpoint what is it that we you know where do we where do we like i said where do we begin i mean what do we need more of immediately well i think that you know i think that looking at our you know glia contracts for quite a bit you know, to handle quite a bit of, of wastewater volume. And are we looking at, uh, are we looking at the, the need to, to work with you know, the folks that are part of the service area? It's a huge service area. A lot of wastewater comes in and goes to the uh, wastewater resource recovery facility down, down river on Jefferson. It's one of the largest wastewater treatment plant um infrastructures in the country if not the world and is it is it fair to to run all that volume to that single um single treatment plant i mean cleveland has a regional system uh but they have three satellite plants okay westerly southerly easterly and you know is this part of the game mm -hmm. you know to reduce the amount you know, kind of right size the amount of volume coming through mm -hmm. and allowing the system that's in place to to handle the flows, you know, from the east side, from the points, from Harper Woods, you know, all the way down Detroit River from, mm -hmm. you know, and our, our west side friends and colleagues and then down river folks. So you know, it feels like there's a regional, larger scale approach, but then, you know, level of service, you know, would include how do we prevent sewer backups in people's basements? And, you know, so I think improving that infrastructure, okay. there would have to be a grant program um, to, to do that, um, but to, it might be to the benefit of our utility providers to to make sure that we have consistent infrastructure you know that goes into their system mm -hmm. uh there's a you know when when i talk about the infrastructure being in poor condition it's largely because there's a lot of cracks and settling over mm -hmm. time okay. the system was put in 1920s you know mm -hmm. kind of peak construction and built upon, built upon, built upon, you know, it's a, it's a web of underground, you know, plumbing. Mm -hmm. And how's, how's that work? Well, if it's leaky, that means that we're getting groundwater coming in when it rains, water soaks in through the soil and then enters pipes. The net effect is that it's taking up the valuable capacity in our wastewater uh, conveyances and we end up treating a lot of stormwater mm -hmm. and groundwater rather than just the septic flow wastewater, sure they call well, that me, inflow and infiltration let me let me ask you this um you know we've talked a little bit about infrastructure but there's also an administrative or managerial bureaucratic whatever you want to call it component to this um you know I've heard a lot of Detroiters complaining about the Great Lakes Water Authority, uh, that they don't want to, uh, that they haven't done enough, that they don't necessarily want to take responsibility for this. I've seen stories where they're sort of shifting blame to the city. The city's like, you know, you guys are in charge of the water. So it's your, it's your job. From an administrative standpoint, what are we looking at in terms of the problems? Um, is this a problem with the Great Lakes Water Authority? Is this something that Detroiters need to be concerned about? Do we need to revamp this in some sort of ways? Do we need to think about going back to city control of the of the water system? Uh, what, what are some of the administrative bureaucratic issues that we're grappling with here? This, this is going to be, I think, more difficult to, for me to, to address because I think that um, there's a very complex relationship between DWSD 
in Gliwa, mm -hmm. yes, there's very clear separation of responsibilities. Um, but Gliwa has taken on responsibility. They're contracted to to take, you know, basically take wastewater, deliver drinking water, and to do that um, in, you know, according to the terms of the contract. Uh, I I think there's there's now lawsuits or people stepping down. There's re reorganization, but what it comes down to is level level of service that you know achieving you know basically equity and level of services you know that nobody you know who's uh getting services from Gleva should have to put up with you know ba basement backups of septic flow or mixed septic with stormwater um or flooding you know you know getting anywhere from a trace of, of septic or, or flood water in your basement to eight feet, you know, it's basically pushing up on the joists and the floor of your first floor. Um, and so, you know, like clearly there's, there's, there's room for, you know, where, where's, where's the responsibility for the, you know, for the, the pump failures, say at Freud and, uh, and Connors Creek pumping station. Um, is there an interaction with the, the high rate uh, treatment or the CSO uh, facility at Connors Creek? Um, you know, the Blue Hill pumping facility. All these have been, you know, there was a lot of analysis done in 2016. It's one of the more recent massive events uh, that cited pump failure as, as an issue. Um, so my, to my knowledge, there are there is independent assessment of this going forward. And you know, will these recommendations be binding? Well, I guess that all goes through a through some sort of legal process, you know, that compels um Glio to respond uh at some level. And so I think that you know, Detroiters, I think anybody in the Gleewa service area, it would be to their uh, to their best in their best interest to educate yourself about you know what's going on here. Hopefully, these interviews are a step toward that. Um, you know, talking about you know, there's just basic basic information out there about combined versus separated sewer systems, and you know what where is your community? in the service area? Are you downstream? Are you upstream? Are you more vulnerable, less vulnerable? But, you know, the, the, the communities that really lit up during the, during the, the flood, uh, flood and wastewater malfunction events, uh, in June and July of this year, um, the, we're going to call these out as the most vulnerable communities, I think. And, you know, there's, I think there are other ways, you know, that we're, we're approaching this. Um, you know, our Center for Urban Studies and Healthy Urban Waters here at Wayne State University, looking at the basically human health effects, how's this affecting folks? Right. And, and so we know, you know, through their work, how this affects Detroiters, East Siders, you know, Gross Pointers, Harper Woodster, Woodsters, um, you know, and, but then this, this moves to more of an engineering focus and approach, basic data, basic designs that serve, you know, get the level of service consistent and up to par. Um, I feel like there was something else I wanted to hit there, but, um, well, we're, we're, we're getting, you know, I promise not to keep it too long. <laughs> yeah. So I want to, I want to honor that promise because I know you're a busy man. You've got a lot of stuff to do, but I, I, you know, as you, as you're thinking about, it, I just want to kind of open up these last few minutes to you to perhaps explore uh, any other ideas, suggestions, thoughts, things that Detroiters should know about this issue that perhaps we haven't had an opportunity to touch on. Is there anything else you'd like to share? Well, I see if I have some notes here. Um, 
I think that we want to look at uh, downspout disconnection okay. and in the the use of green infrastructure. Um, in the latter case, green infrastructure has been floated as kind of a silver bullet. Um, this is something that I worked with a lot over my 18 years with a uh, federal EPA uh, at the water lab in Cincinnati. So I worked for a national lab and basically worked around the country, Cleveland, uh, Ohio, Camden, New Jersey, New Orleans, Louisiana, Phoenix, Arizona, um, Omaha, Nebraska. And we actually worked with these, these cities to, at, in some of the cities, negotiate under the Clean Water Act. Uh, I was a technical um, lead on, um, you know, I wasn't a lawyer in these proceedings. Uh, that was Department of Justice. Uh, but I worked with the Department of Justice to say, hey, you know, we need to take a look at green infrastructure, but it needs to be very um, very structured approach. Mm -hmm. It requires assessment, you know, like what do we want to do? Can it do what we're asking it to do in the place that we're putting it? Or is it going to aggravate existing problems? And so for Detroiters, I, I really want to put it out there that, you know, there are ways um, to get the benefits of green infrastructure, but we have to be really really careful with that. So working with the Eastside Community Network, um, Jefferson East Incorporated, um, you know, here at Wayne State, we're here to, to basically help make these decisions, you know, or guide, you know, I, I wish I had a team, you know, like a, the funding uh, for a team to do just that, because that would be a valuable, you know, data equity supporter. Yeah. And because there are other benefits we get from green infrastructure, it's just uh, making sure that, you know, if we're putting more water in the ground, we don't want that to go right into your basement. We don't want it to go into the sewer system. Uh, we don't want you to flood out your neighbor. Um, and that's with downspout disconnection as well. But these are all, these are all important aspects and, um, you know, certainly appreciate your time. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I would highly recommend, um, you know, I can give you a list of people who I think, you know, we're going to need some community organizing around this. And um, to that end, uh, we're in the midst of writing a watershed management plan for the Detroit River communities, including Hamtramck and Highland Park, um, and possibly the points. And this, this is just a, a fundamental, it doesn't, it, it's not a magic wand, it doesn't make everything better, but it's a fundamental way of making our communities eligible for federal, other federal funds and philanthropic funds. Um, when you have a plan in hand, you know, you can move these things forward. It's also a way of illustrating the unique nature of how we live with water in our Detroit communities, in the points and Harper Woods and Hamtramck, and when can we when can we look for this study? Is there a well, this is study? this is an actual plan. We're working with uh, uh, Dr. Althea Wells uh, is uh, leading. Uh, she comes by her what I would call wastewater and stormwater justice uh, through some unique. Um, path, you know, path journey there. And I would suggest having her on the show sometime. Um, but we're working with Eagle, um, you know, the Jefferson East, uh, Eastside Community Network. Um, of course, Wayne State is involved, uh, Sierra Club. Um, and this is this is exciting stuff because it's it's, it's like building a grassroots approach to trying to deal with this. This is absolutely the way to do it, and to to illustrate is well, so I, important. I just got one other question, Bill. I guess I can get ready to let you go. Is there any place that's that we look at and we look out in the country that's doing it right? That perhaps has similar circumstances to Detroit. That Detroit can look at and go, "Hey, that's a potential model for at least some of the things we want to do the right way." Well, I think that you know, Portland, Oregon, uh, 
you know, is probably largely a newer system overall, but, you know, they've, they've kind of balanced green and what we call gray infrastructure, you know, like pipes, pumps is the gray infrastructure, green infrastructure is the contiguous, you know, like built for purpose, um, green ways, uh, green spaces. But they've also been able to call out, hey, you know, these are the limitations of both. You know, nothing's magic here. Um, and so uh, there's Portland, but Detroit is unique, you know? And I think that's, again, getting to the data equity part, you know, we can be a part of, of this. And this is so important to understand from our unique water resources standpoint that we have, you know, that, that we're water rich, um, but how do we live, you know, with water? Right. And if, if it's affected our, our, the foundations of our homes and our basements, what are we doing to, to change our habitability? Um, you know, are we abandoning basements and putting HVAC in the attic and laundry and domestic hot water on our first floor? This, you know, we have a new um, uh, faculty member who's joint with engineering technology, uh, Dr. Hyung Koo. Uh, and she's, I think she's starting today actually, um, but she's a construction engineer and, you know, like how do you how do you reimagine, you know, the formidable management, you know, project management, and materials and construction to get homes reset for the future? And so know. it sounds like there are a lot of different things. There's a lot of thinking outside the box. There are engineering aspects. There are social social aspects to this. There are a lot of different things. Geographical. It sounds like right there's a lot a lot of stuff that we're gonna. We're going to have to balance. Okay, well, listen, we're going to get ready to wrap it up. Uh, I just want to say thanks again, uh, Bill. I really do appreciate you, you joining us. This has been a very informative conversation. Um, is there one particular place, source, where you would suggest people go to find out more about this? You talk about Detroiters educating themselves about this issue. Is there really quick, like, is there a website or is there one central location where you would suggest folks check out just to begin to educate themselves about this issue? Well, I'd, I'd go to the GLIOA website and say, and there's a, there's a, you know, a page that says, this is what DWSD does. This is what GLIOA does. Okay. I would suggest going there and just saying, well, I have a question about this, mm -hmm. right? I'm not quite sure I understand, you know, this, this part. Um, you can type in uh, combined versus separated sewer systems. And there's lots of great graphics out there that show these are the differences, you know, this is the difference. And, you know, for the most part, Detroit has a lot of combined sewers and that, that affects, you know, the Detroit River, it affects Lake St. Clair, uh, basically all of our lakes uh, for different reasons. Um, so, you know, that's one place to start, okay. you know, go to the route and kind of work your way up, but, there's no dumb question out there. I mean, when I when I talk with with officials, I take it from basic principles, you know, because that's the way you build knowledge. You start at the most fundamental, and uh, there's no dumb questions out there, uh, especially under circumstances like this when we're trying to, you know, we're not going to be digging up the whole city and putting in, you know, larger pipes. I, I just don't know if that's you know, a practical way of doing things, but you know, yeah, but we've got to figure out something. We got it, yeah, we've got to right on, right on. Outside the box, inside the box, we've got to figure out a way to, to get this thing figured out. Well, listen, Bill, I, I I got to get ready to wrap it up, but I want to say sure. thank you again. I really appreciate you taking your time, and I really hope you'll come back to join us because I'm sure this will be a problem that we'll need to discuss into the future. I look forward to staying in touch and. You know, let's let's keep the ball rolling. All right, man. Well, thank you so much. I'm Daryl Dawsey. This is the Today at Wayne podcast. Thanks for listening to Today at Wayne. We'd love to hear from you, our campus community, about other podcast ideas and topics. What compelling things are you doing to spread the good word about living, learning, working, and playing like a warrior? Let us know by visiting todayatwayne.edu.